grade 12 and in today's lesson we're going to be revising functions. I'm so glad that you could join us and I hope that you learn a lot from today's lesson. If you've been doing functions, and obviously you have if you're already in grade 12 maths, if you've been doing functions for the last few years, you know that there's so many interesting applications of functions. Functions are literally all around you. You just have to look for them. So what exactly are we going to be doing in today's lesson? Well, we're going to look at some of the key concepts that you've already covered in grade 11 functions. We will look specifically at the parabolas, hyperbolas, and linear graphs. And then we're going to combine functions together and then work uh, on some of the questions where those uh, functions are combined. All right, so what I'd like to do is to start off the lesson by throwing it back to you, giving you some time to discuss the terminology, some of the concepts that we will be doing today. And the most important thing, you keep hearing this word, function, function. What is a function? And the very first time you were introduced to this was way back in grade 8, and then hopefully your teachers have been repeating this terminology over and over again, and hopefully a lot of you are really, really familiar with the terms that we use when we talk about functions. So I'd like to give you two minutes to discuss what is a function and uh, name and sketch some of the functions that you may have learned so far and also just look around you, look around in your classroom or you know on your walk home from school or your walk to school, what are some of the functions that you can see around you? So we will give you two, mi two minutes to discuss this and then we'll come back and do it together. Well, I'm sure you had a lot to talk about there because you have been doing functions for quite a few years now and hopefully you all came up with some really interesting ideas of the ones around you. But let's start off with the first question I asked you, which is, what is a function? Now, obviously, if you look around you, you see that some quantities are related to other quantities in some way. Functions help us to better understand the connection and relationship between things. So functions help us to understand this connection or relationship between objects or, or, or between variables. Functions can take on inputs from many variables but always give the same output that's unique to that function. So if two variables are connected in some way so that um, each value of the one is dependent on, another, on one of the values of the other, then we say that one is a function of the other one. So for example, if you think about just in nature, what's around you, something that could be a function is if you look at temperature, 
That is a function of the time of day. Obviously, temperature can be related to many other things as well. But let's think about temperature and the time of day. Now, you know that it's hotter at midday, and then it gets cooler, and then eventually in the evening, it's really cooled down quite a bit. So we can say that temperature is a function of the time of day, because as you see, temperature changes depending on what time of day it is. So that's an easy example that you could perhaps have thought of yourself of something around you in your environment that you see or you know you are used to seeing where one uh, variable is a function of another. I then asked you to name and sketch some of the functions that you've learned so far. And the very first one that you learn is called the straight line graph or the linear function. So this is our linear function. All right. And remember, the important thing with a function is two variables are connected. So we say a function relates an input value. Let's just write this down. So a function relates an input value, which are usually your x values, but it can be any variable, an input value to a unique, and that's the important thing, to a unique output value. All right? And the way you would have heard and interpreted this in earlier grades is we would use something called many to one to represent functions or one to one. And what that means, many to one, it means that you can have many x values going to one single y value, so many different x values equivalent or with the equation that gives you the same y value, whatever that may be, or you could have one x value going to one y value. So you get one corresponding x value for each corresponding y value, and that's a one-to-one -one function, or you get a many-to-one -one function. The important word here is the one, right, that re uh, usually represents your output value, and that means that one is the same as saying it's unique. It's a unique output value. So you could have many different x values, but one unique output value. The other thing, just while we're on the linear function, you also learned to do the vertical line test right in the beginning when you started learning functions. The vertical line test, remember, if you pass a vertical line through a graph, that graph is a function if the vertical line only crosses it at one point each and every time. So let me quickly just... Um, find a ruler here to remind you guys about this vertical line test while it's still on my mind. So this vertical line, if I pass it through the graph, you'll have a look and see what's happening. The green line is only ever cutting the red graph, the linear function, at any one point. It never touches at more than two points. So you use something called the vertical line test initially when you did functions in grade eight to test whether a graph that was drawn is a function or not. Obviously, we now have gotten to grade 12, and hopefully beyond the vertical line test, where you can simply look at a graph, and just from looking at the graph, you'll be able to tell whether it's a function or not. All right. Okay, so we were talking about the linear function. That's the first one that you learn, and uh, that has the defining equation. Let's use a different color there. Y is equal to mx plus c where M gives you the gradient or the slope of the graph, and C is your y-intercept. The next graph you were introduced to, the quadratic function, or the name that we use most popularly, is parabola. All right, and we'll discuss more of these graphs in detail um, as we go on, especially the parabola. So its equation is y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, but I'm very briefly looking at this. The next type of graph you learned was the hyperbola. And we're also going to do this one in a little bit more detail later on, so I don't want to dwell on this too much, but this was the function that was defined by y is equal to a over x minus p or x plus p plus q. All right, and we'll discuss a little bit more about those variables as well. Then you learned about exponential graphs. So you could have given any one of these as, because all I ask you to do is to name or sketch a function that you've learned so far. So really any one of these that you remembered would have been fine. So your exponential graph that has the defining equation y is equal to a 
times b to the power x plus p, and we added plus q there to show a vertical shift. Okay. All right, so you could have given any one of those, but maybe some of you were thinking about your trigonometry functions, and so you may have given your example as any of these graphs, either your sine, cos, or tan graphs. Each and every one of them are functions, and you also have been doing that now for two years at school. All right. Okay, the next thing I said was look around you and give descriptions of any functions you see. And I think this is quite important because especially with maths, we just think about it only in terms of maths and just the rigor of here's the question, do the question, apply the rule, and that's it. And I think it's very important to relate maths to your environment, look around you, and see where, where's this maths really being used, where can I see these patterns or these descriptions, and certainly with graphs, there's so many places. So the one that I've got up for you on the screen, the example, is if you take a banana, and I mean, we've all seen a banana, right? You can superimpose, so I've drawn, you can see, well, it has been drawn, this parabola or quadratic function can be drawn along the curve of the banana, and it does follow a specific quadratic function, and those values of A, B, and C can also be seen. So A is 0 0.1. So if we had to write out the equation defining that curve on this specific banana, you'll see that you have... 0 0.1, which is a tenth, x squared, b is 0, so we're just going to have um, 0x, which is just 0, and then c is 0, so you're also going to have no y-intercept, so start passing through the origin there. Okay, so your defining equation, y is equal to 0, 0,1x squared, perfectly describes this curve that you find in the shape of a banana. All right, another one which I really like, and it's uh, one of the most famous parabolas in South Africa, certainly, and that is in our beautiful Moses Mabida Stadium there in KZN, all right? And so over that stadium, you see a very nice parabola, and it lights up, and it looks completely gorgeous at night as well, but that's a very famous example in South Africa of a parabola or quadratic function. And I hope that you were able to look around you and come up with different ones. I only looked at quadratic functions, but there's many others around you, and I hope that you were able to find some of those. All right, so what I want to do now is I think uh, I want to give you some time to quickly think about some key concepts, and then we'll take a quick break after that and come back and discuss it. But I'd like you to think about the concepts of the quadratic function and the hyperbola. And uh, what we can do is, while you're thinking about that, your, your key things that you can come up with, what you can remember really about quadratic functions, what you can remember about hyperbole, you can write that down, and uh, we'll take a quick break while you're doing that, and then we'll come back and discuss these two graphs together. Welcome back, everyone. So during that break, I gave you a little task. I said, please discuss everything you remember about a quadratic function and everything you remember about a hyperbola. And hopefully, you remembered quite a few things. But in this segment, we're going to go through and discuss those properties and just jog your memory if you have forgotten. Okay, so one of the graphs that you will see over and over again is the quadratic function, which we commonly refer to as the parabola. Okay? Now, in the graph that I've drawn for you, I want to point out a few key features, but before we do that, let's just remind ourselves the defining equation of a parabola is y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c, or you may sometimes see it written in the other form, the completed the square form, which is y is equal to a into x plus p squared plus q. Okay, so those are the two defining equations. Both will give you exactly the same thing, provided the variables are the same. All right, now let's discuss some of the key points that you will see on a parabola. A specific graph that we have drawn here, we know that A is greater than naught. How do we know this? Well, we have a minimum turning point, or a happy face graph, as I like to say. So we have... A is greater than naught, giving us a minimum turning point. 
and therefore we have um, this parabola corresponds to a being greater than naught. Now let's look at some of the other lines and arrows and stuff that you see on your screen. So you can see that it's been marked off the line of symmetry or what we call the axis of symmetry. Okay, and what the axis of symmetry does, symmetry being the key word there, it exactly divides the curve into two equal pieces. So this graph is symmetrical along this line, along that axis of symmetry, which I'm just going to make a little bit darker for you. So there's your axis of symmetry, and um, that uh, divides your graph into two perfectly equal halves. All right. You will also remember that you have a turning point in a parabola. Now, what a turning point does, well, it's where your graph turns, obviously, but it turns at the axis of symmetry and some value for y. So this is our vertex or our turning point. That's the word we more commonly use. And the turning point to get the coordinates it's x is equal to negative p. And then the other value, the y value, is q. All right, so your turning point is made up of minus p and q. Okay, so that's the value there that's showing the arrow vertex. Okay, the other important thing that you need whenever you're sketching a parabola, certainly, is your x-intercepts. And remember, your x-intercepts are where the graph cuts the, y -ax uh, the x-axis, and it's where y is equal to 0. So you let y equal to 0 to find your x-intercept. And then your y-intercept, that's where the graph cuts the y-axis. And that you get by saying let x equal 0. So those are the points of intersection with the x-axis and the y-axis. So when you're drawing this curve, now remember there's a couple of things that you need to find if you were sketching your parabola. You need to know the shape. So you need to know whether A is positive or whether A is negative. So if A is positive, you get a graph similar to the one I've got on the screen where you have this happy face graph. In other words, you have a minimum turning point Minimum problems, as I like to think about it, so therefore you've got a smile on your face, right? So you get that graph, or if you have A being less than naught, you get a negative graph. Let's draw that one. So if A was less than naught, we get a turn like that, and that's more like a frown, right? Because you've got maximum problems. Okay, so if you have A being less than naught, you're going to get a maximum turning point. Okay. And then some of the things that I'd just like to remind you about as well. So if we go back to our defining equation, y is equal to a times x plus p squared plus q. So this is going to describe the shape, right? The p tells you the horizontal shift, or in this case, it's going to give us our axis of symmetry when we're dealing with parabolas. The Q will give you the Y part of the turning point, or it will also be a vertical shift. So there's two ways to think about these variables. Right? And uh, I think that's everything that I mentioned there. So we've got the P done, the Q done, the A. And if you've got all of those things in mind, you'll be able to sketch your parabola in a really good way, in a way that you will give you all the marks in your tests and exams. So that's it for the parabola. I think we now need to move on to the next one, which is the hyperbola. And yes, there is a lot of things to remember, but you guys have been doing these graphs, certainly the parabola and the hyperbola now, since grade 10. So hopefully, over the last two years, you've accumulated a lot of knowledge and now all of this is just coming right to the top of your mind and you remember it well. Okay, so now we're looking at the hyperbola. So there's some special things about the hyperbola and hopefully in your discussions you came up with the same special points that I have here. So our defining equation, y is equal to a over x plus p plus q. That's the defining equation of the hyperbola. The very interesting and different thing that the hyperbola had was it had what we call asymptotes. Okay, 
Now, what is an asymptote? Well, an asymptote, and I'll give you a nice formal definition here if you are making notes. So it's a line that the curve approaches. So it's a line the curve approaches as it heads towards infinity, as it heads toward infinity. Okay, so in other words, what are we saying? It's a line that the curve approaches. So in blue, you have your hyperbola, right? It's approaching this asymptote as it's going to infinity. Remember, the arrow at the end means it's going to continue forever. But the thing with this is this hyperbola will never, ever reach the asymptote. So it's a value that it gets very, very close to, but it never actually ever equals that value. So it just approaches that value, it will never cross that line. So be very careful when you draw your hyperbole that you don't make your little arrow at the end go over the asymptote because that is not correct, okay? It will never ever touch the asymptote. Okay, so an asymptote, it's a line that the curve approaches as the curve heads towards infinity. Okay, other important things about this graph we also have our axes of symmetry, and remember your symmetry, it divides the graph into two perfectly equal pieces, so they're just exactly the same thing on both sides. And here in your hyperbola, you have two axes of symmetry. We have this one that's sloping toward the right, and I will give you a general equation. This always works for any hyperbola, so y is equal to... So if I want to find the equation of this line, y is equal to x plus p plus q, that will be the equation of the um, a line of symmetry that's sloping towards your positive numbers, so your gradient is positive. And then on the other side, the line with the negative gradient, you get y is equal to negative x plus p plus q. You can use those defining equations to find the equation of any axis of symmetry of any hyperbola, okay? So you might want to take these down if you don't know it already. So on the graph that we've got, we'll see that our axis of symmetry is y is equal to x plus 1. And then the one that slopes towards the left-hand side, the one with the negative gradient, that's y is equal to negative x plus 1. Okay, what else do we know about this hyperbola? Well, let's go back to the defining equation and have a look at some of the other letters. So we've got A here, and just like in the parabola, we talked about how A affects the shape. A here also has an effect on this hyperbola. If A is greater than naught, you have an, a decreasing, as in the case that I've got drawn here, you've got a decreasing function. Let's talk about this word decreasing. Now, hopefully all of you remember what a decreasing function is. If you don't, I'm going to quickly remind you. A function is decreasing if, as the x values increase, right? As the x values increase, the y values decrease. Okay, so look at your graph and see what's happening. So as the x values are getting bigger, so we're moving to the right. Okay, we're going one, two, three, four, and we're going on infinitely. Your y values start on the top there, and they start decreasing. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and they're approaching this line y is equal to one, which is our asymptote. Okay, so as our x values increase, our y values decrease, and that's what we call a decreasing function. So you can imagine for an increasing function, it's the opposite. So if a is less than naught, we have an increasing function. So in other words, as x increases, the y values increase as well. Okay, um, remember your asymptotes. Let's go back to that. We have an asymptote here on this graph of y is equal to 1. I'm simply reading it off the graph because it passes through the point 1 on the y-axis, so this is what we call a horizontal asymptote. So we get horizontal asymptotes, we get vertical asymptotes, and we get what we call oblique asymptotes as well, but you need to really worry about the horizontal and the vertical. So if we go back to our defining equation, 
x is equal to negative p, x is equal to negative p, that will be my vertical asymptote. And y is equal to q, that would be the horizontal asymptote. Okay, so we've talked quite a lot about this defining equation for each of the graphs, just really to remind you, because I know when it gets to this time of the year, we generally have forgotten a lot of the work that we've done in grade 11 and definitely from grade 10. So this is just to remind you what functions you've come across so far. Now, I want to go straight into doing maths, and I'm going to give you a chance to have a look at this, and um, you get a chance to actually do this question for yourself, and we will discuss it together. So I'm going to give you two minutes to have a look at this. Okay, so I'm sure you're saying, now, no, I need more time. It's too long. I need to take this down. So what I'm going to do is, is we're going to go to a quick break, and you'll have time then to discuss the question. So what you have drawn in front of you is a parabola. You've got a straight line intersecting the parabola, and you have to find the coordinates of T, which is the x-intercept of the straight line, and you have to find the point of intersection between the straight line and the parabola. We'll go through all of this when we get back. Welcome back, everyone. So I hope that you've had a good discussion about your parabola and your straight line intersecting. And I hope that, more importantly, you knew what to do with this. So this is an example of what we call graph interpretation. And what happens in graph in interpretation is you get given the graphs in a diagram, and then you asked questions about the graphs. Obviously, very, very common in exam situations. Let's get straight to this question. They gave us the turning point is S, and that's the point 118. They uh, gave you that it is a parabola with the equation f of x is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. In other words, at this point, we don't know what the values of a, b, and c are. They tell you that p and t are the x-intercepts of f of x. So if I go to my graph, what they say there needs to correspond, right? So I can see, yes, P and T are cutting definitely the x-axis. So those are the x-intercepts of the quadratic function or the parabola. The graph of G of x is equal to minus 2x plus 8. So we're going to write that in because we know what that equation is. So the straight line graph, we've got that equation and we know that it has an x-intercept at T. Okay, so you can see that on your graph. Interestingly enough, it's also a point of intersection with the parabola. OK, 
Okay, so at that point, they're going to have the same coordinates. R is the other point of intersection of the two graphs. So that's there. Okay, your first question says, calculate the coordinates of T. So it's a good thing that we read the question because you would see already and you should know immediately what to do because T is the point of intersection, we said, of the straight line with the x-axis. In other words, what do we call that? It's the x-intercept. And remember, your x-intercept, you work out the value for your x-intercept by saying let y equal 0 because anywhere along the x-axis, your y value is 0. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward that one. I know that my defining equation of g of x is minus 2x plus 8 and I'm trying to find the x-intercept. So I'm going to say let y equal to 0. And remember that g of x is just a fancy way to name the graph. So that's the same as y. g of x and y are the same thing. So therefore I can say 0 is equal to minus 2x plus 8. I'm solving for x. So what do I do? Take the 8 over to the other side. So I get minus 2x is equal to minus 8. And now I need the x by itself, so I divide both sides by minus 2. So minus 2 divided by minus 2 just leaves me with x. Minus 8 divided by minus 2 is positive 4. Very importantly, because they ask you for coordinates, it's not good enough to just leave it like that. You need to write it as a coordinate. A coordinate means an, an ordered pair. So we need to have an x value and a y value. So we know that x is 4. We also know that y is naught because we said let y be naught. It is the x-intercept. And I always go back just to see that it makes sense. Yes, I'm on the positive side of the y-axis. That where all my positive x values are. So therefore, it makes sense that t is positive 4. If you really had enough time and you know you had maybe 20 hours to write your exam, you could even then go back and substitute into your parabola if you had the equation and see that you got the same answers. Okay. But you generally don't have that, that much time, so just make sure that you are careful and you follow through your steps um, in an orderly process. Okay. Let's get straight into the next one. So here we're looking for the coordinates of R, and R is the point of intersection between the parabola and the straight line. So, they've given us, and that's very nice, we now have the equation of the parabola. That's important because if we didn't have the equation, we would need to go and find the values of a, b, and c. So I know f of x is that, and I know that g of x is this, minus 2x plus 8. Now you've got to ask yourself, how do I find points of intersection? And again, it's something you've been doing for quite a while now. In order to find points of intersection, so that's where the two graphs have everything in common. Everything is equal. So it makes sense to equate them. So to find my points of intersection, I have to solve simultaneously. Okay, so let's get straight into that. So this is 1.2. I know that g of x is minus 2x plus 8. And I know that f of x and they gave us this, is minus 2x squared. If you didn't have this, you would obviously need to go and find the values for a, b, and c. And you certainly do have enough information here um, to find those values if it were not given, it, given to you. Okay, so we've got written down now, we've got the equation of g, we've got the equation of x. I'm going to call um, the first part equation 1, and we can call this one equation 2. Okay, so... Remember, we said we can rewrite this as y is equal to minus 2x plus 8. And f of x is the same as y as well, right? It's just a different function. And I'm going to say substitute equation 1 into equation 2. Okay, so I'm going to replace y in the second equation with minus 2x plus 8. So let's have a look at that. So I've got minus 2x plus 8 is equal to minus 2x squared plus 4x 
plus 16, okay? Um, and then we need to solve for x. So we're going to take everything over to the left-hand side. So I'll get 2x squared minus 2x minus 4x because I'm taking it over from the left from the right hand side so I need to minus 4x on both sides so I get minus 4x plus 8 minus 16 is equal to naught. Okay we can then simplify this so we get 2x squared minus 6x minus 8 is equal to naught. Now some of you do prefer at this point to factorize this equation as it is, but what I would suggest you do is just divide through by this 2 to make life a little bit easier so you've got less factors to work with. Okay, so we divide through by 2 and we get x squared minus 3x minus 4 is equal to naught and you can then factorize that into x minus 4 times x plus 1 and we get therefore x is equal to 4 so from our quadratic equations you should all remember by now how to do quadratic equations when you've got the product of two factors equal to 0 you let each one equal to naught and solve for x so if x minus 4 is equal to naught I get x is equal to 4 and if x plus 1 is equal to naught, I get x is equal to minus 1. But remember, it's not good enough to stop at this point because we need to find, again, a coordinate. So I've only got x values. I still need to know what the y value is. Now, you've got two values to choose here. And hopefully what you realize is that x is equal to 4 is not the correct one to choose because that was already the coordinates of point T, which was the other point of intersection. So the one we're interested in is the x is equal to minus 1. That will be the x value at point R. So now I take that, I substitute back into equation 1. All right, and equation 1 was y is equal to minus 2x plus 8. So I substitute x is equal to minus 1 back in here, and I get minus 2 times minus 1 plus 8, and that's going to give me minus times minus is a plus, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 plus 8 is 10. So therefore my y value at point R is 10, and the x value is minus 1. So your coordinates there is r is minus 1 and 10. And again, I will go back to the graph. And it needs to make some sort of sense to you uh, uh, in terms of its positioning. Yes, we can see that it's on the left-hand side of the y-axis. So it certainly should have a negative value on x. And we can see it's on the positive arm of the y-axis. So it makes sense for it to have a positive value for y. Okay, and that looks a bit... There we go. Minus 1 and 10. And that's your point, r. Okay, hopefully all of you got to the same answer. It is quite a long one, so I think the, the concept itself is not what will give you problems. The thing that will give you problems here is if you are careless. So if you don't be very strict with yourself and you start thinking about what am I going to have for lunch, etc., 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 and you don't concentrate on what you're doing, that's when you're more likely to make mistakes with a question like this because most learners do understand this concept of if I'm trying to find a point of intersection, I need to solve the equations simultaneously. Hopefully you understand that too a little bit better now. Okay, I've got another question for you to do, and this one is based on the hyperbola, and we are going to give you three minutes to have a look at this one, and then come back and do it together.
Okay, so that should have been enough time for you just to take the question down. I know that working out the values for A, P, and Q may take a little bit longer, but it's not an extremely long process. Let's go through it very quickly. Okay, we've got the graph g of x is equal to a over x minus p plus q. And as soon as you see this, you should recognize this as the defining equation of a hyperbola. All right. Before I even look at the rest of it, I can already make some statements just from what I'm given. I can see that x is equal to p is going to be the horizontal asymptote. Sorry. And I'm not thinking there, so that's going to be the vertical asymptote, because obviously that crosses straight through the x-axis. So that's your vertical asymptote. All right, and then y is equal to q would be my horizontal asymptote. It goes straight through the y-axis. Okay, so I already know that. I'm keeping that in mind. They tell me that C, the point 2, 6 is the point of intersection of the two asymptotes. And B, 5, 5 over 2, so 2 and a half, and, the, and 0 is the x-intercept of the hyperbola. Write down the values of A, P, and Q. So you can see that B, this point here, cutting the x-axis, and that's 2 and a half and naught. So that's your coordinate there. Okay, we need to find A, P, and Q. Now, P and Q, I'm going to say, are quite straightforward. And the reason I'm saying that is because they've already given you the point of intersection of the two asymptotes, which is really nice. Because the point of intersection has an X value and it has a Y value, which is great. Because that means if I follow that vertical line going through the point C, if I follow it down to the axis, that point there is going to be 2. And then if I follow the horizontal line onto the y-axis, that point there is going to be 6. So that's going to be the point 0, 6. And here on the x-axis, we see, if we carry on that line, we see that it's cut straight through the x-axis at the point. x is 2, y is 0. And I know that x is equal to p is the equation for the vertical asymptote. And what did we see the x value along that line is? It's always 2. So therefore, x is equal to 2 is the vertical asymptote. And y is equal to 6 is the horizontal asymptote. And that's interesting because I've already said up here, x is equal to p. So that must mean that p is equal to 2. And we said y is equal to q. So therefore, Q must be equal to 6. So we've got our horizontal and vertical asymptotes just from what they've given us. So, so far my equation now looks like this. Y is equal to A over X minus 2 plus 6. Okay, and that comes straight from that point of intersection that they gave us. Now this is really nice, but is it complete? No, because we still need to find the value for Y. Um, sorry, for A. So what we need is another point that lies on the graph, and we have that point. We have the x-intercept, so we can substitute that in for x and y and solve for A. All right, so if we do that quickly, I'm going to get 0 is equal to A, and 2, 5, 2 and a half is the same as 5 over 2, minus 2 plus 6. Okay, all I've done there is I've taken taken my defining equation, put in my value for P, put in my value for Q, and then substituted the point B in, in order to solve for A. And then I'm going to go through this equation very quickly. It's going to give me 0 is 2A plus 6. So you can simplify that, and you get 2A. And so you get negative 2a is equal to 6, so a is equal to negative 3. Okay, and then we've now got all the values. We've got the values for a, p, and q, and so, yes, we've answered the question. We found the defining equation of this hyperbola. So we've covered quite a lot in this lesson, and that's because it really is covering so many years of graphs that you have done. I quickly want to look at the summary that will help you certainly when you're sketching graphs and then when you're interpreting graphs as well. Okay, so for all the functions we look at, the following are always true. 
The addition of Q will translate the graph vertically by Q units with no change in the shape of the graph. If Q is positive, the graph will move up by Q units. If Q is negative, the graph will move down by Q units. Okay, so moving down by Q units when Q is negative, moving up when Q is positive. Multiplying X by A, so in other words, whenever there's an A in front of your variable, that will stretch or compress the graph, depending on whether it's a fraction or it's a whole number. So it will stretch the graph vertically by the factor of A. So if A is between 0 and 1, that will compress the graph. So in other words, it's going to make it squashed. And then if A is less than 0, so if A is negative, it reflects and stretches the graph. OK, and one more thing I want to add in here is remember that with the value of P, that describes your horizontal shift. And if P is less than 0, so if P is negative, your graph is going to shift to the right. So it does the opposite thing. And then if P is greater than 0, if P is positive, your graph will shift to the left. Okay, we've covered so much today, and I do know that, and I hope that um, you've managed to take all of this in, and you've processed it, and you are much better for it, and you're much better at functions now. That's it from me, Natasha. Until the next time, cheers.